Okay, it, uh, it looks like we have most folks here. So um, again, I'm gonna say welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this kickoff program for the Chancellorsville 160th anniversary. We're so glad to have you. Uh, my name is Beth Parnitza and I am the branch manager for interpretation and education here at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. Um, we're starting our anniversary with an event like this uh, because we have the goal of placing the Battle of Chancellorsville within the larger context so that we can better understand our past from all perspectives. Um, we are really delighted to have uh, Dr. Stephanie McCurry with us today. Um, she's bringing a lot of expertise, especially about the year 1863 uh, to us this evening. Um, for some logistical things, I would just say that um, we're gonna have everybody muted throughout the program. Uh, but we will accept questions for the question and answer period, which will come uh, after Dr. McCurry's talk. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring them, collecting them, and then uh, sharing them with Dr. McCurry at the end. So feel free to put things in at any point in time, as well as save things for the question and answer period. We'll be happy to have any and all of those. So uh, to introduce Dr. McCurry, without any further ado, um, Dr. Stephanie McCurry teaches at Columbia University, where she is the R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of American History. She specializes in the 19th century United States, the American South, the American Civil War and Reconstruction, and the history of women and gender. Uh, Stephanie is the author of three books, including Confederate Reckoning, Power and Politics in the Civil War South, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History and winner of the Frederick Douglass Book Prize. In 2019, she published her most recent book, Women's War, Fighting and Surviving the American Civil War. Her writing has appeared in numerous venues, including The Atlantic, The Nation, The TLS, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Irish Times. Next year, she will be a fellow at the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library, where she will be working on a book about reconstruction that identifies the intimate as a domain of power that reframes the history of the era. Again, thank you so much, Dr. McCurry. We appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you so much, Beth. And hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm delighted and a little bit honored to be asked to kick off this Park Service series of events on the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville. And as Beth suggested, I'm going to try to draw a pretty broad picture of what the of the social context and what, political, political and social context where that battle transpired and what it meant in the his, history of the Civil War and of the Confederacy. So I guess I would just start by saying that the spring campaign in Virginia in 1860, uh, as part of the spring campaign in Virginia in 1863, that battle at Chancellorsville came at a moment of reckoning for the Confederacy. And it was, one, it was a moment in which the strains of war on the people of the Confederate States had pretty much reached a breaking point. So it's two years into the war and things that had been working stopped working. We already know that Confederate armies were facing a real shortage of food. And in Virginia, Lee was dispatching units to hunt up food and forage. And we also know that his armies and many other um, Confederate armies were sustaining losses in men that they couldn't replace. So the strains on the military are growing. And I think this is an element of Civil War history that isn't really well understood by military historians. The way the social organization of the Confederacy as a slave society shaped its capacity to wage war. And by that, I mean literally to put armies and men in the field, to arm them, to feed them, to move them, to pay for them, and no less important, to sustain the support of the people of the Confederacy uh, for the war effort and for the Confederate cause. So that's what I wanna talk about today and hopefully it'll help kick off uh, this series of anniversary events. I wanna talk about the broad social context of life in the Confederacy in 1863 and its implications for military history. So I guess I would start by talking about the, Confe the, the, the Confederate people and the Confederate cause. So the structural problems that are faced by a slave regime at war, which is much of what I'm gonna be talking about today, followed from the cause of the Confederate nation and the very slim foundation of democratic consent on which the, the Confederacy was based. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, the problem of democratic consent was inherent in the very limited idea of the people in the new republic uh, that slaveholders seceded to build. So if we could have slide two, the union uh, is dissolved. Part of the goal of seceding from the union, could you move the next slide, please? Yes, part of the goal of seceding from the union was to defend, to defend slavery as a legal form of property that the government was obligated to protect. The Mississippi Declaration said we have four, the, the South has four billions of property to defend, that's why we're seceding. And to do that, the Confederate States and federal government also had to, to suppress dissent and limit democracy. So they wanted to build a government explicitly pledged to the protect, to, sorry, to the enslavement of black people into per perpetuity and to the permanent limitation of the vote, the right to vote to white men. They wanted that exclusive idea of the Republic as they understood the founders uh, intended it to be. Um, but as you know, in Virginia, as you will surely know, these are, this secession was very divisive to begin with all over the South, but especially as you can see from this map in Virginia and all along the Appalachian chain, not exclusively, but there's tremendous opposition to secession from the beginning as a political project. Um, and so the limitations of the Confederacy's view of democracy made many, many white Southern men uneasy to start with. And from the perspective of the upper South and say Virginia, there were many white men voters in 1861 who looked on the secession of the deep South, South states with real suspicion. They didn't trust the big slaveholders there for that matter uh, in the deep South or for that matter in the Eastern parts of their own state. So there's divisions within states and across the whole region of the South. And as you all I'm sure know, Virginia only seceded when the war started. And even then four upper South states uh, stayed with the union. Um, but the challenge for co the Confederacy went far beyond the latent unionism that you can kind of see on this map to discover th the, the challenge for the Confederacy was they had to, they had to sort of overcome this, uh, this unionist block, these unionist blocks, but they also had to uh, build, they had to discover the significance of the support of all of the people of the Confederacy. So uh, when secessionists, politicians, claimed the consent of the people as they did, what they meant was white male voters. They didn't mean the whole population of the South. They meant white male voters. And that means that the, if you think about that, what does that really mean? So to, just to do the math really quickly, the whole population of the South, 40% of it is enslaved and disfranchised. Of the remainder, 50% of that is female and disfranchised. So that meant that in practice, maybe a million and a half uh, white Southerners out of a total population of 10 million people ever got to have a say about the wisdom of secession and their willingness to risk war. But the problem was, if you could take the South out of the union with the votes of a million and a half people, if you could create the Republic that way, it would have taken all 10 million to defend it and support it in war. So the union had its own issues for sure, issues of desertion, issues of consent, draft riots. They had a big uh, challenge of thinking also about how a democratic people sustain a long war. But for the Confederacy, because it was a slave society, the scale of the problem was different. And when you remember that so many uh, non-slaveholding whites were opposed to secession to start with, you start to grasp the top level of the program. So if you could put the, the next slide, you see the problem of deserters. I think this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, broadside about hunting deserters was 1861. So from the very beginning, you know, there's a problem of how do you maintain support? How do you, how do you keep the support once the war is a reality? And so add to that what we have learned in the past 25 or 30 years about the actions of enslaved people in the history of the Civil War and emancipation. So as much as Confederates refused or, or, or were unable to think of slaves as part of the people, in fact, as it turned out, their politics mattered and the actions they took to destroy slavery in the slaveholders' republic turned out to be fundamental in its defeat.
But there was one other huge population of Southerners excluded and disfranchised, white, white women, and most of them from non-slaveholding families. In 1861, no politicians cared about their views or bothered to ask whether they supported secession, whether they were willing to run the risk of war. But by 1863, it was a different matter, and the Confederate project, the nation-building project, was subject to the judgment of its own people, by this point, all of its own people, um, uh, including the women and the slaves. And this is what I mean by the reckoning. So when I talk about Confederate reckoning or when we talk about 1863 year of reckoning, that's what I'm saying. The narrow idea of who we as a people are who support and endorse this decision, this, this war, now they need the support of far more people than that to support the war effort and, and to build the armies. So there are structural problems that a slave regime faces in war. And I think here we have to maybe just agree on a relatively simplistic, but I think generally accurate view that this was the first really modern war. I mean, some people call it total war. I don't think that's true, but it's certainly, and it's, and it, but it was an industrial war. And it was the first modern war in terms of the scale and the way it moved between battlefront and home front, the way it transformed the whole society. So what is the difference between the North waging that kind of war and the South as a pro-slavery republic? You know, they're trying to establish a pro-slavery republic waging that. And the problem has to do with the peculiarities or the challenges of a slave regime at war. So the Confederacy has an economy and a population a fraction the size of its enemy. The North has 10 times the South's manufacturing capacity and, it's, and the South's population of 10 million uh, people uh, is dwarfed by, this, by the North's 20, the Union's 22 million. But when you think about it, even that understates the problem because in addition, 40% of adult men in the South were enslaved and unavailable for military service. So who can the military call on? Only white men. It was as if they had a population of only 6 million whites, in fact, but then think about it further, half of them are women and a large share of the, of the other half, the 3 million are underage. And in fact, there was one estimate early on in the war from the Confederate Conscription Bureau that the maximum number of white men that would be available to serve would be about 800,000. And we know the Confederacy got super close to that number. Um, so what did this mean in practice? Well, it quickly became clear what these kind of Union Confederate imbalances meant. That it meant that the South, the Confederacy, had to exert insupportable demands on its own people and take drastic measures, uh, drastic even by the standards of the North. And so the, the main thing that this meant was that the Confederacy was forced to mobilize a far higher proportion of white men uh, than, the, than the Union. And after only one year of, uh, of uh, war, so by April of 1862, as many of you probably know, the Davis administration was driven to adopt the first conscription act in American history. So the limits of voluntary service were already reached and in anticipation of the spring campaigns of 1862, uh, already the government had a force through conscription and this is supposed to be a states' rights government, and this is a huge federal centralist imposition on the will of the people. And when all was said and done, a staggering 75 to 85 percent of white men served in the Confederate military, compared to 50 percent in the North. And if you look at this picture right now, like look at this kid in the middle. I mean, how old do you think he is? I mean, maybe 16 maybe 15. So the military age was initially, I think, um, 20, I, I forget where it started, 21 to 35, and then it got moved to 50. But by the end, it was 15 to 55. And life expectancy is just not much greater than 55 years, even in peacetime. So they are, they are mobilizing, in the end, a staggering percentage of the adult white male, even teenage and adult white male population robbing the cradle and the grave to keep men in, uh, to keep the military machine fed. 
the Confederate government is also forced to adopt a variety of labor and tax policies uh, that bit back on them and land hard on the population too. So to say the government tested the limits of popular support for war is an understatement. They're asking a tremendous amount of the people and it's falling disproportionately on yeomen and poor whites. Because, com because it's combined with exceptions the government is forced to make for slaveholders, exemptions that allowed people who owned more than 20 slaves uh, to have to be exempt from military service. And so as, as, as conscription is being introduced in 1862, it's quickly becoming charged with cries of rich man's war, poor man's fight. So that's where this comes from. Who's actually going to have to serve? Who's actually fighting and dying? Um, and so by 1863, 1863, at the time of the spring campaigns and Chancellorsville, the head of the conscription bureau is already saying that he cannot get any more men. It's done. They have no reserves to pull on. And the pressures on the government and the army are reaching the breaking point. And they're forced to confront the will of far more of the Confederate people or the Confederate population than they had ever considered relevant to the waging of the war. And by that point, enslaved people had made their actions count in pressing the Union government to embrace emancipation as a war aim. And I'll come back to that. So that's what 1863 looks like. But I want to start with something less well understood than emancipation. The spring of 1863 in Richmond, Virginia, when the mass of poor white confed I, start, I should say that the, the well, less well understood in, in the Confederacy and, of, and also in Richmond, Virginia, when the mass of poor white Confederate women forced the government to answer to them. So that's two years into the war, women who have never had any place uh, in political life and uh, never had any um, expectation that the government cared what they thought or that they could make demands on it. Suddenly everything breaks open and they are pressing the government about what they need and what they want. So I want to begin with the question and ask you to think for, for through with me what this, what this is like. And the question is, what does a home front look like with 75 or 80 percent of adult white men gone? Right? So hard to imagine what that kind of a society looks like. And then we have to remember that unlike the North, the South is a rural agrarian society. Whole regions of it are populated by yeomen and poor white families. Slaveholders are a third, and they get to have more men at home than yeomen and poor white people. In the rural South, there had never been any expectation that women could make subsistence on those small farms without the labor of men. And the fact of the matter is that they could not, especially when teenage boys were also being conscripted. So by 1863, with husbands and sons in the war and the countryside, as they said, literally stripped of men, with army quartermasters requisitioning food everywhere for the army, the food crisis in the Confederacy reaches star starvation proportions. And the War Department knows it. I have read the internal communication of the War Department. They know this, and they're, they're still trying to feed the army. They know that they're taking, they're taking food from, from people who can't afford to give it. There's a, a, allegedly a 10% um, tax, but they just take what they need. So this, this crisis, this starvation problem, turns into a political crisis provoked by women who mobilize to force the government to fulfill its promises to protect and support, who, who had promised to support and protect them when they took their men to war. And this kind of politics of subsistence, as I think of it, and the new political class of soldiers' wives who made it, is one really unexpected or unanticipated element of the reckoning war had brought on the Confederacy and on its armies by 1863. So even as the Confederate government is attempting to get every white man in the army, as it's sending out home guard units to hunt deserters, and also you might know from the novel or the movie Cold Mountain, to hunt women who aided and abetted guerrillas and unionist guerrillas and deserters, as it struggled desperately to supply armies for the spring campaign, 
the government is also facing the political challenge from the mass of white Southern women in their new collective identity as soldiers' wives. And this is the story I tell in my book, the one I published in 2010, about the way the women deluged officials with warnings about the consequences of a military policy geared towards the interests, as they bitterly put it, the interests of the big men. They would say, take those big men into the army and send my husband home. They ain't no use to us here. This is the women who've never written a letter to a government official before, oftentimes transcribed by somebody else. And by the way, just in case you're interested, unlike the correspondence of union women during the war, which often came on pre-printed forms where they we filled out, like you would call it, like, you know, those messages you get now that says, call your senator if you care about this, they would get these pre-printed forms, you know, but for example, petition for emancipation proclamation. But in the Confederacy, it's these barely literate handwritten letters. Eventually, after I read thousands of them, I realized there was a kind of a format, but it's really, a, it's a begging letter, a petition, a begging letter. Um, and so they're deluging War Department officials and governors with warnings about the consequences of the military policy. And for more than a year, they're besieging state and federal officials with their warnings about uh, about the uh, about the situation and they threatened all kinds of action if they were not satisfied and if you when i was reading these letters progressively they got more threatening between a, in 1862 they were kind of begging by 1863 they're saying we're going to call the guerrillas down on you we're going to put, put the unionists uh, out on you we're going to burn this place down and you know maybe the war department thought they were empty threats um but they were spit and they and, and in and in these letters, these letters increasingly become collective and they start speaking in a collective voice. There would be 40 signatures and they would sign it, we soldiers' wives, and then all their names. So instead of just one letter sent my husband home, now they're saying, um, stop requisitioning food from us. You need to return food to the county. You need to let our men out of the army. You need to let this guy stay home to look after us. And they're, they're starting to critique the policies. Um, and so they're demanding not just individual relief, but something that starts to sound like justice for the Confederate poor. So you can see this escalate between 1862 and 1863. And all of this evidence is in the archives where it has been missed for generations. Um, and in fact, if you read a lot of the books on class, and the and the you know and desertion and the civil war the confederacy you'll see these letters cited but historians never acknowledge that they're from women they just say that you know the poor whites in the confederacy are writing these but it matters that they're being written by women because this is a different history um so all this evidence is sitting in the archives where it has been missed for generations none of it is digitized you can't read it in a book there's no documents that the park service can use but nobody missed what happened next. In the spring of 1863, just weeks before the Chancellorsville battle, Confederate soldiers' wives took direct action in a wave of spectacular food riots that hit the South from Mobile to Richmond. And then mobs of women, numbering from a dozen to more than 300 in, in, individual, in, in particular cases, and armed with Navy revolvers, bowie knives, and hatchets, carried out at least 12 violent attacks on stores, government warehouses, army convoys, railroad depots, salt works, and granaries. These attacks occurred in broad daylight, and they were all perpetrated in the space of one month between the middle of March and early April. They culminated in Richmond on April 2nd, now, after this wave of riots is, he is heading across, it's, it's heading north. So there's, there was a lot of theories, copycat, railroad lines, but the favorite conspiracy theory was that these must be the work of men, Yankee spies, Yankee operatives, because women couldn't organize this. And in fact, there has been for a long time a little bit of work on the Richmond food riot, but it was never connected to anything that came before. So it was just seen as this thing that erupted and there was more information. 
like for example, in Mobile or Atlanta, we do not know how anybody was organized or showed up with placards that said bread or blood, literally. So in most cases, we don't know how the riots were, in organi were organized, but in Richmond, because of the municipal court records, we do. And as it turns out, it was not the work of men, but it was actually organized by one Mary Jackson, a soldier's mother, a farm wife, and a huckster in meat at the public market. She had tried to solve her problems through appeals to the Secretary of War to release her son from service, one of the thousands of angry, threatening, half-literate letters to government officials written by soldiers, wives, and mothers over the course of the war. So in other words, what I'm bringing to this story of the bread riots is, and the, especially the Richmond bread riots, is the tip of an iceberg. And these riots have a really deep backstory. They're the most dramatic manifestation of, a new, of the new political realities in rural and urban con communities in the Confederacy, what I call soldiers' wives politics of subsistence. Because what they're going after when they break into granaries, army depots, and everything else is food. They're going after uh, subsistence. Now, I don't want to exaggerate this, although it's interesting. Most women never cross the line to direct, to direct action. But when Mary Jackson got no satisfaction from the War Department, she recruited 300 town and country women from an orbit of 15 miles around uh, her home. She, she recruited 300 town and country women to a meeting at the Belvedere Baptist Church. She got up in the pulpit to rally her troops. She told them to gather the next morning at the entrance to Capitol Square, to leave their children at home, and to come armed. And this is one of my favorite details that came out in the court case is that it's kind of like saying, we're going to have a riot. You will need a babysitter. Like these are women with young children basically arming themselves and, or, and, and mobilizing in the corner of Capitol Square. There are very, very detailed descriptions of what happened from the court records. So this is truly a Confederate spring of soldiers' wives discontent. And in this case, the women made themselves count. The wave of food riots had a measurable impact on Confederate war policy, forcing revisions of conscription and tax policy. But the most important thing it did was, was force the development of a massive welfare program by the states that in reallocating scarce funds and foodstuffs to the relief of women and children dwarfed any kind of welfare undertaken by the governments in the North. And they, this exacerbated the crisis of feeding the army, because as you'll see from the next slide, quartermasters were forced to return food. Oh, wait, look, I forgot to tell you about this. This is from Harper's Weekly. It's, it's, it's an image of the, 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 the knowledge of the food riots. Davis, uh, Pre President Davis tried to close off the telegraph line so that the word of this would not get out. And believe me, it got out and it got out fast and it was all over the newspapers in the North. And this is Harper's Illustrated Weekly, I believe. And uh, this is the image they drew of starving women. Uh, but you can see that some of the women are deep, pretty well dressed, right? Like they're, it's a, it's a strange thing. And actually I have to say, when I look at this, it reminds me of incredibly similar, similar images of unruly women in the French Revolution, the ones who marched onto Versailles and demanded the king. Um, this is, this is a stock image of the fear of mobilized women in moments of radical activity. So it's an interesting image, but if you give me the next one, you'll see this is what I was actually talking about. It's very blurry, I, I apologize, but this is basically a soldier's wife signing that she got a, a relief package. And if you show me the next uh, slide, you'll see that this is an order telling General Early to protect soldiers family supplies to no, take no more wheat, that the wheat is now being purchased for soldiers' families in the counties of Augusta and Rockbridge. It's not liable to impressment. The army commissaries cannot take it, and it will be released if they have mistakenly taken it. So this is what you get. Huge, in, in, in Georgia, millions of dollars um, committed to the relief of soldiers, wives, and children. And I kind of made the argument in, in my book that 
this is the, the, the soldier's wife is the quintessential deserving welfare recipient. She's given up her men for her country. The government owes her this, but they didn't give it voluntarily. It was extracted as, uh, as a result of this. So what's the political upshot here? I think by 1863, literally what? Two weeks before Chancellorsville, in the heart of Confederate national territory, the mass of white Southern women had emerged as formidable adversaries of the government in the long struggle over the justice of its military policies. And by insisting that the government live up to its promises to protect them, these poor white women who had never participated in politics before stepped decisively into the making of history. And this is the way I think we should think about this. Um, if the new political assertiveness of Southern women didn't bring down the Confederacy, and I'm not arguing that it does, I am arguing that it represented a powerful challenge to the original Confederate very limited vision of the people. They had forced their government to recognize them as part of the people whose will and consent and support mattered. And basically what they were saying was any government that took their men would ultimately have to answer to them. So that's one area of how the Confederate reckoning was already seriously underway by 1863. And in writing this kind of women's history into Civil War history, I'm trying to draw direct consequences for the ability to wage war. Food is going here, it's not going there. Desertion is, uh, uh, is increasing in part because women are starving at home. Well, the reckoning with enslaved people's politics, I think you could say was even more direct and consequential. At the very beginning of the war, to rewind the reel and go back to 1861, in the process of secession, planter politicians gave no thought at all to what slaves would do. They discounted entirely the matter of, of slaves' allegiance. And if you read their speeches and their reports in the newspaper, as a person now in the 21st century, you read these and you think, what did they think was going to happen? It's really important to try to get back in that headspace and understand what they thought. They, they were so instrumental in their view of enslaved people that they thought they could command their labor without any uh, commitment of their will. And that might sound abstract, but it gets real very fast. Because as we now know, enslaved people, men and women both, by the way, not just the ones who ended up as black soldiers, moved decisively to grasp the opening history offered in their own long war against slavery. They had never consented to this. They had struggled against it in ways that were mostly covert so that they could attempt to survive it. But one of the most interesting things about all of this is I literally mean like I wrote a whole book that literally was saying, what did they think was gonna happen? You know, you go to war as slaveholders. Did they not know what had happened to other slaveholding regimes that went to war? They never stopped talking about Haiti and or San Domingue as they would call it. So they thought they were gonna be different, right? Well, no. So as we now know, this is, uh, they, they were, um, and by the way, there were numbers of politicians in Virginia, unionists who said, this is insane. And also they said, this is insane because this war is going to be fought, fought where we live and you're bringing this apocalypse on us. But if that's the way they were thinking slaveholder, slaveholding elites and politicians were thinking at the beginning, it really wasn't very long before owners, the government and the army were forced to recognize enslaved people as the enemy within. And people unavail not people who were not simply unavailable to the Confederates the Confederacy for military service, but were also clearly lending their strength to aid the enemy. And this is long before uh, black enlistment in the Union Army. One of the things I did in my book was read plantation records, uh, planters' accounts from. Um, December 1861, when South Carolina seceded. And I'm telling you, by December, they're already freaked out. They're writing, the slaves expect to be emancipated when Lincoln comes in. Yes, they did. 
They knew that there was a Liberty Party. They knew that what, what the Republicans stood for. They didn't know what was happening immediately, but they were ready. Um, and so the problem was evident first, actually, to masters on plantations. That's where that knowledge of, oh, oh okay, now it's a different moment, who as early as January 1861 found evidence of what they called sedition, as well as powder, uh, gunpowder and guns in slave quarters, insurrectionary plots, and networks of slave communication providing valuable intelligence to the enemy at the points near the coast where they had already landed, starting obviously with um, Fortress Monroe, Virginia, the area around there, and then quickly uh, around Port Royal in South Carolina. But slaves' activities had crucial consequences, not just for the owners, but for the Confederate government and military as well. Confederate politicians had begun the war boasting of slaves as an element of strength. And really what my book, what the last part of it does is trace how they went from thinking of slaves as an element of strength. And by what, what they meant by that was, yes, we have a smaller population than the, than the Union, but we can put all of our adult men in the army and we can use the slaves to support the home front because they're workers. And we can use some of the slaves for military labor. A lot of what soldiers do is dig entrenchments, move stuff around. So they were trying, they were confident that they had this extra manpower that they could use. So they boasted of them as an element of strength, uh, but they soon began to think of them as an element of weakness. When they demanded the labor of male slaves to support the war, a policy called impressment it was a requisition on every slaveholder to send about 10% of his adult male slaves to do work for the army um, around Yorktown, around Port Royal, et cetera. Um, when they made these requisitions, the government and the military soon found themselves in a losing conflict with slave owners who were unwilling to surrender valuable, heavily mortgaged, an openly rebellious property to the army, which after all, wherever the army was, the Union Army or Navy was never very far away. So the most dangerous points in the, in the Confederacy. This is a picture of James Island, South Carolina, a drawing. And even as the government attempted to draw on slave property to wage the war, slave owners tried to draw on the, on the army to protect slave property from the war. Indeed, many saw the army as nothing less than a giant slave patrol and complained bitterly when military plans exposed their property to the enemy. Is not the protection of property one of the duties of an army in the field? A Virginia slaveholder wrote his congressman, demanding that the army position itself to stop the, st the flow of slaves to the enemy in his area near Newport News. So this is an example. I think you've probably had other um, programming on this already. This is a brilliant, beautiful photograph. The photograph was a new technology, so this wasn't easy to do. And one of the things that really moves me about looking at this is we end up with a narrative about black men and their contribution as soldiers, you know, to we they earned their freedom through military service. Well, there's a lot of grandmas on that cart, and there's a lot of tiny children, and there's women as well as men. And they also were going somewhere else. They were they were uh, rebelling against the Confederacy. Their first job was to destroy slavery, especially their own slavery. Their second was to survive it and the dislocation of war. And, men, and for many of them to aid the enemy if they could uh, in the process. Um, so slaveholders are losing property uh, at every point. And the idea that they would just voluntarily um, sacrifice their property to the army was absurd and they wouldn't do it. And it was basically massive civil disobedience as far as I can see. And if you read the internal correspondence around Yorktown, for example, they kept requisitioning people to build up fortifications and they never got anything like what they were supposed to get. And then they'd have to send the army out to force the owners to give up the slaves. So it was just a losing battle. And taken as a class, slaveholders proved spectacularly unwilling to sacrifice property for the nation. The mo one mobile, uh, mobile newspaper uh, declared, the planter is more ready to contribute his sons to the war than his slaves. Planters colluded with their slaves in thwarting impressment. They sold cotton to the enemy 
They took oaths of allegiance and occupied territory to hold on their onto their property. And they demanded that politicians represent their interests against the demands of the War Department and local military commanders. And there are reports from Union uh, soldiers saying that um, they found Union, they, they found Confederate pickets at the weirdest places positioned to keep slaves in, not Union soldiers out. So that's another interesting story about the military history of the Confederacy, how the army is actually positioned to protect the big plantation areas not to fight the war. But if slaveholders could prove a weak link in the Confederacy, even bigger resistance came from the slaves themselves, as we are already seeing. Enslaved men resisted impressment for a variety of good reasons. It forced a separation from their families. It withdrew their labor from the support of their families, and it exposed them to significant threat of disease. Only men were impressed, right? So that's there was a separation of the families there. And the mix of the state's lack of power over slaveholders and slaves' resistance created intractable problems for military commanders. And by 1863, these pressures are building. And slaves' success in pressing Union policy forward, their role as the enemy within, was already a manifest in Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, in which you, you will remember he cast emancipation, he, ca he cast freeing slaves as a military necessity. It was, we need this, we need their support and their service. Men subtracted, uh, so when it came to, the, with, with the Emancipation Proclamation came the enlistment of black men in the Union Army. And around 200,000 black men served in the Army and the Navy, um, the majority of them formerly enslaved people. And these were men subtracted from the Confederate military and added to the Union one. And this made the Union Army an army of liberation with black troops uh, in, 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 in the forces. Um, and what you have is Union soldiers like this going to studios, young men going to studios to get their picture taken uh, in, their, in, their, in their uniforms. Um, and then you have refugee camps filling up with other men and women, enslaved women refugees working in support roles for the Union Army, while building family and community lives in the spaces of the camps, attempting to build precursor lives to freedom, uh, working in all kinds of ways themselves. And part of what I try to do in my book is make it clear, like when these planters wrote their bitter lists of who ran away and they said, who, who li, li, uh, tra traitors on my plantation, like they make these lists. And if you look at the lists, there's tons of women on, on those lists, including with infant children. So we need to get over these fictions and over the, the narrative of the Black Union soldier is a huge improvement over the old story about emancipation, which was, it was the gift of Lincoln, you know. But the idea that Union soldiers are the only ones who contributed to emancipation is a fiction. There were 4 million enslaved people in the South in 1860, and there's 200,000 in military service by the end of the war. So I'm not trying to diminish that, I'm just saying there are bigger ways there are bigger ways to think about um, the contributions that people make. By mid-1863 in the Confederacy, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the reckoning part, at least some parties in the military and the War Department and in Davis's cabinet are beginning to recognize that enslaved people are a direct problem, that they're not an element of strength, that they're an element of weakness. In fact, the greatest element of weakness and that they have to do something either to punish treason or insanely enlist men uh, in the Confederate cause. Okay, so interesting chapter of Confederate history uh, between late 1863 and 1865. So first of all is the question of slaves as traitors. And you can see the dilemma the military faces. It comes to an official head early on in Pensacola Harbor in March 1862, when a Confederate officer uh, initiated a court martial of six slave men caught escaping to the enemy at Fort Pickens. He was sick of seeing slave men going to the enemy across the bay, revealing all the positions of his uh, men, where the guns were, where the pickets were, et cetera. So he court-martialed them. 
and their master went ballistic. What were the charges? Attempts to violate the 57th Article of War, giving intelligence, holding correspondence with or giving intelligence to the army. As the master incredulously ranted, who ever heard of a Negro slave being arraigned before a court martial for the violation of the Articles of War? Who indeed, in charging slaves with treason, the officer posed profound questions about their political status and membership in the polity. Were slaves just property under the complete authority of their owner? Or were they people capable of making decisions about loyalty and treason? Okay, think about the definition of treason. Quote, acting to overthrow the government or impair the well-being of a state to which you owe allegiance. Well, that's interesting. Do slaves owe allegiance to the Confederate state? Can they be traitors? Are they subject to military law? Of course not. But Confederate commanders had to try to do something to recognize slaves as traitors, if only to contain the military damage they posed on land at sea. And I wrote a, a, an article a few years ago about Robert Smalls, who was a great example of this um, absorption of huge amounts of military intelligence so that when he stole the, uh, the steamship, the planter in Charleston Harbor, he not only took that piece of military hardware, he took a huge amount of information about the, the operations of the Confederate Navy on the Southern coast. Okay, so what is the reckoning that comes here? We talked about the reckoning within, with um, the, the disfranchised people, the women who were not recognized as part of the people but came to count. And now there's, there's going to be a reckoning with uh, enslaved men. So the strangest and strongest indication of the crisis of the Confederacy started to manifest itself seriously in late 1863. So this is after Lee's victory at Chancellorsville, after he successfully goes north into Pennsylvania, um, and then of course his, his retreat or loss uh, at Gettysburg, where he's bleeding troops and he there's nobody left to replace them. And this is the, a point at which the Bureau of Conscription says there's no more white men to be had. And then beginning with one officer in the Army of Tennessee, talk began about the need of, uh, for, to enlist slave men, the need for black soldiers in the Confederate Army. So this is like Alice in Wonderland kind of stuff. The most expansive plan was offered by this guy, a major general in the Army of Tennessee, an Irish-born man from Arkansas, Patrick Claiborne, who in December 1863 in winter quarters in, in Northern Georgia, uh, made clear the stern logic of events in the slave regime at war, the, just the hard map of what it is to be a slave regime waging a modern war. The most blunt assessments of the damage slaves are wreaking on the Confederate military come from military officers, and his is the most blunt that you will ever read. I teach it every semester to my students. It's, they never forget it. He said, we are waging war with an enemy in the front and an insurrection in the rear. And he urged Davis to confront the problem of slaves' allegiance and to do what he had to do to earn it for the Confederacy. Now, his most shocking contention was not that the Confederacy used slave men to replenish its armies, but that the only way it could be done was by recognizing slaves' own political objectives in the war underway. He said, quote, we must bind him to our cause by no doubtful bonds, and the only bond sufficient is the hope of freedom. It would be preposterous to expect him to fight against it with any degree of enthusiasm. When we make soldiers of them, we must make free them, freemen of them all, men, women, and children, beyond all question. That's a quote. And by a long, circuitous route that I'm not going to tell you all the ins and outs of, President Jefferson Davis and General Robert E. Lee eventually were forced to contend, as Claiborne had, with the humanity and politics of the slaves whose status as property they had succeeded and waged war to secure and defend. When, when Davis found out uh, about um, Claiborne's memo, he read it to the officers in his um, camp. 
and he was told never to circulate it, that he would be arrested and tried for treason. And when Davis found out about it, he deep sixed it so far that the document didn't resurface until I think the 1880s. Um, and it's so it's a memo. Uh, but the irony of this is that's December 1863. By November of the next year, numbers of governors in the West had already said this had to be done. And by November, Davis goes to the Confederate Congress and starts trying to lay the um, the basis, the, the 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 what's the word the the yeah the the groundwork. Thank you. My, I'm getting tired. The groundwork for this. So by a long circuitous route, uh, with Lee supporting this. Uh, 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 they try to come up with a plan for enlisting slaves in the Confederate Army. By 1864 and 65, they were forced to try to win slaves over to the cause because they so desperately needed their military service. And incredible as it might seem, at first they wanted to enlist, they, uh, uh, I'm sorry, incredible as it might seem, they wanted to enlist slaves as soldiers. That is to say, men who were still enslaved as soldiers. So Davis sort of thought he would have a, 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 pay, a pay now, collect later um, kind of program. Military service, if you're loyal afterwards, will free you, but only you, not your wife and children or anybody else you love. Bad plan, that was never gonna work. This is what Claiborne was saying. So, so initially they wanted to enlist slaves as soldiers and even then enslaved men, as still enslaved men. But even then, with national survival at stake, very few of them were prepared to entertain emancipation as the terms of that service, what Claiborne had told them they had to do. And in a tightly controlled, top-down way that included the public solicitation of General Lee's support, President Davis, the Secretary of State Judah Benjamin, the Virginia Governor William Smith struggled and mostly failed to gain the support of the public in Congress for the use of slaves in the Confederate Army. Congress did eventually pass a law allowing the use of slave men in the army, but explicitly stating that the law, quote, did nothing to authorize a change in the relation which the said slaves bear towards their owners. In other words, they could not cancel the property rights owners had in their enslaved property. Congress, in other words, proposed to enlist still enslaved men they refused even at the 11th hour. And this, by the way, is February, 1865. By the time these negotiations are getting down to the wire, they're exchanging telegraphs. Nobody's writing full letters. It's just totally emergency communications. Telegraphs are saying, move these men here, move them there. And they're trying to get this through Congress while they're at it. Um, so there was a partial move in that direction, although one that didn't come to fruition. With Lee was entirely opposed to take enslaved soldiers. He refused. He said they would never, he would never be able to use them. With, with Lee refusing, they circumvented Congress, the Confederate Congress, and the War Department wrote orders requiring that slave men could serve only by their own consent and with free papers from their masters. Now that meant they were no longer slaves. It's asking slaveholders to voluntarily free them, which was not going to happen in any number significant to work. But by late March 1865, desperate for men to hold the lines outside Richmond and Petersburg, even Lee dispensed with that requirement and called on the governor of Virginia to draft all Black men, slave and free, between the ages of 18 and 45 as soldiers. In the last desperate days of the war, two companies of black soldiers were raised and drilled on the streets of Richmond and dispatched to fight on the fortifications in front of Petersburg days before the end. Very little remains in the record by which to ascertain their status. We know numbers of them had been working as orderlies in hospitals, were impressed men already. Um, but the Confederate Congress and the Virginia legislature refused to the bitter end to condone the emancipation of any slave men who served. So this is to me, this is the slaves are an element of strength. This is the arc of this story. Slaves are an element of strength. Slaves are the, the biggest weakness. When a, when a slaveholding republic is brought to enlist slave men in its cause, there is no more cause. And that's exactly the arc of what has happened here. The story of arming slaves and how the Confederacy arrived at, the, arrived at that juncture 
is surely the most dramatic kind of reckoning they had brought on themselves by going to war. In risking war, they gambled and they lost, they lost everything. This was seen as an absolutely clear sign of defeat by the Union. This is a cartoon that ran in Harper's Weekly already when rumors of this were getting out. You'll see the date, 1864, because Western governors were already talking about this. And basically, this is just saying, yep, they'll be enlisted by the Confederacy for five minutes. Five minutes later, they'll be fighting for the Union. This is just an absolutely unfeasible plan. So Davis and his cabinet had been forced to do really the unthinkable undermine owners' paramount claim to their slaves and move to enlist slave men to save the slaveholders' republic. That episode certainly doesn't imply, as many people continue to insist, that the Confederates chose independence over slavery, as so many profes even professional historians continue to say. I think what it is is a profound indication of the structural problems waged by a slave regime in war and the ultimate measure of what slaves' opposition brought in Confederate political and military life. The Confederacy was transformed by war, and the Confederate political project was done by the very people who had been taken for ciphers in it. So let me just wrap up with a couple of last thoughts. As I said before, and as you all know, because you're here tonight, after Chancellorsville, Lee made his famous move north into Pennsylvania, and, uh, and into Gettysburg. And among military buffs and military historians, you know, there's an endless and enjoyable conversation about the turning point of the war. Is it Antietam? Is it Gettysburg? Is it whatever? At this point, the one we've been focusing on tonight, the spring and summer of 1863, Lee is holding on in the East, but the Confederacy is losing in the West. There, Grant and Sherman's armies are moving South, liberating and recruiting hundreds of thousands of people as they went. It turned out to be much harder to build a pro-slavery nation and defend the institution of slavery in what is now rightly considered the first modern war in which the support of the military, I'm sorry, in which the support of the people and the military service of the mass of men was key. It couldn't happen without both of those things, the military service of the majority of adult men and the support and consent of all of the people, not just that narrow band of white male voters politicians had thought were the ones they had to reckon with. And focusing on the social structure of slaveholding society and what it meant for a nation in war, we see all of that in a new light. Military defeat was coupled with political failure and far more of the people were involved in that story than the usual military history tells. So I'll leave it there and take your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. McCurry. Um, just a quick reminder to go ahead and put any questions y'all have in the chat. Um, and Becca will be kind enough to compile and read those uh, for Dr. McCurry to answer. We were right on time, Beth. If only we could say that of all NPS presentations. <laughs> Just invite the right people. I know, we'll recruit you as a ranger, you know, anytime you'd like. Sounds like a lot of sunscreen, you know what I mean? Oh, we give you broad brimmed hats. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and ask a question to, to get this going. Um, to be more of like a personal like what have you found to be and I know this is probably a terrible question to ask when you've got an entire book to draw from um, but what are some of the some of your favorite aspects of this story in particular what were things that you found really uh, moving and powerful about your research and the things you're sharing with us today I think you know those things that I um the plantation records, believe it or not, you know, there's this, there's this permanent asymmetry in, in sources. Slaveholders had power in time and place, which also means they had that, the power to shape the archive. And all the paper, you know, you could, there's just millions and millions and millions of diaries, memoirs, you know, speeches, newspapers, art, you know, everything. But what are enslaved people? What is their experience of this? You know, 
we know a lot, but we have to work harder to know it. The record is much, much thinner. There's a massive asymmetry. So I think it, it's it's when you can, even despite that, you can you can see, like for example, there's a planter I, I'm I, I'm writing about again. I'm super interested, always been interested in this guy, um, Grimble in South Carolina, and all half of his slaves, like sixty or seventy of them, run away in one group overnight one day in the spring of 1862. And one of his slaves is sent down to his townhouse in Charleston with a note from the overseer saying, 70 people ran away last night. They were, it was totally premeditated, organized. A naval boat, gunboat came and picked them up. Um, and then he begins this. You can see this guy melting down. Like he has convinced himself all his life, whatever he convinced himself of. And these were his, it, it, and planters always called their, their, their enslaved people, my people, the people. And he just starts making these lists of who betrayed him. And you can see him like psychologically disintegrating, which is amazing. But also this list, he's like, it must have been Kit the cook. You know, he's trying to figure out who's the ringleader. That was his ringleaders and rebels on my plantation. I think that's what the list was called. And on this list are women with three month old babies. Some women leave their husband, some take their mother. There's, they run away in, in lots of family groups. Um, and I'm still writing about this because the guy who brought the, the, the slave man who brought the note to Charleston, his mother ran away. The, his father was the driver on the plane today. Anyway, I'm getting into too much detail. All I'm trying to tell you is the human, the human stories come through, even though the planters didn't intend to tell you those human stories. The other thing is, you know, I knew about bread riots. E.P. Thompson wrote about food riots and bread riots. People, historians wrote about food riots in the French Revolution. I've always been interested in that. And they were always done by women. It's a form of female political protest. Um, so I knew about the Richmond bread riots, but they were always seen as this sort of quaint, quirky thing, you know? And, um, but what did they really mean? You know, it was, just, was, it, 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 was it just desperation? Well, Desperation is you, you lie down on the road and die. Organizing 300 people, that's a movement. So how did they do that? And when I found the municipal records, first of all, I, I, I read all the governor's letters and the war department letters, and I on increasing numbers of letters from women, none in 1860, a trickle in 1861, begging letters in 1862, furious letters in 1863, threatening bread and blood, the exact thing that showed up in the signs. So when I got the municipal court record, and these women are standing up in court saying things, and in the court, the uh, judge and some of the lawyers are trying to still say men organized it. And like Mary Jackson's in there, I think she went to jail. So it, it was it, that is just like being able to put the, it was a huge amount of work. I mean, I must have read thousands and thousands of letters but by the time, and I didn't know they were going to connect to the food, the, the Richmond bread rice. But, but by the time they did, I had the iceberg underneath and the tip. The bread right was the tip. And then I had it. And that's when I knew I had a book. You know, that's when I knew I had something substantial to tell. Um, so the discovery of all of that is uh, still enjoyable and rewarding. That sounds quite incredible. I mean, all of those different pieces and then the ways that they come together. And yeah, especially thinking about how each of these is really a political act um, and a deliberate political act. So I'm gonna turn things over to Becca. It looks like we have some questions, some comments in the chat. Uh, we do. And um, just so everybody's on the same page, I did get a message um, saying not everybody heard Beth clearly. Um, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and uh, we will read them out so that everybody has a chance to hear them. The first question is from Alexander, who says, first off, thank you, Dr. McCurry. I'm curious from your lecture of the CSA's pursuit of deserters, and now learning from you the holding of enslaved people in the South, how much as a percentage do you think it hindered or depleted the Confederate military numbers in the field? The desertion. And um, so the desertion and um, I think that the per, the Confederacy's need to pursue oh, um, slaves. enslaved people and deserters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the there's another part of my book where I write about um, 
the fact that the union had, sorry, the Confederacy had to hunt. Remember that map with the anti-secession vote? Those that's largely the same as the as the pockets of um, unionist guerrilla activity in the Confederacy. So Western North Carolina, you know, West Virginia, et cetera, which you all know that story. Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, just literally down that Appalachian chain, Northern Alabama, Northern Georgia. Um, so there's um, a huge amount of resistance, refusal to, first of all, the, for a year, the, the, for a year, the army's uh, military service is voluntary. So if you're a unionist and you just don't sign up, but a year later, it's a crime if you don't sign up because you're going to get, you're supposed to, you're going to be conscripted. That's when the rubber hits the road and they have to start to, like literally sending detachments of men out to gather up, literally uh, handcuff and carry into camp these men who are evading conscription. And then they start, the, the men start talking about themselves as being treated like slaves. Now they don't have bodily autonomy. Now they don't have free will. Now they're being rounded up like cattle and dragged into camp. But the other interesting part about it, and, and that's, you know, any, any detachments that are out dragging those people in or hunting guerrillas and deserters are, are not fighting, you know, the Union Army. Um, the other super interesting thing about that is, I don't know if any of you have really heard about this. The movie Cold Mountain was terrible, but the novel is amazing, is that um, when they go to hunt those deserters and the, those especially unionist guerrilla bands which are quite organized in some parts of the south as you probably know when they get into those remote hollows and and areas they don't find the men they're out they're they're hiding out and they torture women to get information literally torture them thumbs under fence posts whipping women leaving infant children on the ground in the snow exposed and threatening that they're going to let them die I mean, it's unbelievable. This is another element of women's resistance that is not really, you know, the, the sources are there. It causes, in nor it's especially well-documented in North Carolina, which is where I wrote mostly about it. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the person who tried to actually measure all of this was a historian, a Black historian called Armstead Robinson. And he wrote this book called, I think it was called Bitter Fruits of, Bitter Fruits of Slavery. It's definitely Bitter Fruits. And um, he was obsessed with the map. He wanted, and the maps, he wanted to show every one of these things, that every element of slave resistance drained the, the fighting force of the Confederates, the Confederate military. That's the book that I would look to for the stuff on enslaved people. Um, and, um, you know, I'm making this argument about, I think that the, um, the basically I'm making a broader argument about a slave regime. It's all, slave regimes have a hard time waging war, period. And in this new modern war where one has become an anti-slavery army, it's even harder. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm sort of making a, a, um, a, a bigger argument, but I didn't try to quantify you know what the effect was on the mil on the military. So um, I'm sure people have 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 tried to do that, and certainly Armstead Robinson did. Thank you. Um, all right. So the the next one is actually a comment rather than a question, um, but it's like the good kind of comment, not like the academic conference. I'm going to pretend it. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's from Lucian, and they said, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. This is a discussion of a facet of the Civil War that I have never thought of, nor have I seen any mention of this in the books that I have read. They, they thank you. Um, You're welcome. And then as far as questions, um, the next question is from Robert, who asked, any thoughts on why the Confederacy believed their outcome as a slaveholding nation waging war would be different from those who came before them? Oh my God, like from <laughs> my point of view, in many ways, that's the million dollar question. I mean, I, I, I wrote my first book about the antebellum um, South, South Carolina specifically, and the yeomanry and actually secession, you know, how did they pull this off? Um, and so I, I, I've written about secession uh, three times already and it's completely fascinating like it's a lot harder than people think 
you know, as as the split of the upper south, as the upper south showed. And so, you know, it, I mean, this is a great question. Even after all that time, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer because, as I as I mentioned during the talk, these are these are politicians and slaveholders who have been contemplating the danger of emancipation since Saint Domingue. And all those refugees who came to the coast, right? Philadelphia all the way down. And then when the British emancipated their slaves in Jamaica and, and all the British territories in the late 30s, they had all those examples of well, as well of failed, declining um, uh, um, plantation uh, economies. And with the exception of the British Empire, uh, the British colonies, the French and Spanish colonies, including in Latin America, every one of those uh, emancipations was in war. War destabilizes their control. And so I think they should have known this. So the question then becomes, why were they willing to gamble like this? They could have stayed in the Union. Lincoln wasn't going to free. Like, think about it this way. Did anybody in 1861 think that in four years, all slaves were going to be free? Nobody, even Frederick Douglass didn't think that. So what made that possible? War. Should they have known that? Yes. Why didn't they know that? Because they were arrogant and they were used and they were pumped with power. Some parts of them, you know, they had, uh, I mean, it comes in, in, this is another question is like secession and the Confederacy. Is it a defensive move, you know? Again, that's what they would say, right? Against a union that's encroaching on fundamental rights and is threatening, and we, and we need to we need to move now, or we'll be too weak to resist later. That's the argument. But it takes a lot of confidence to do that. That's not just a defensive posture, and I think the confidence comes from this cotton is king kind of delusional world. Um, but it still doesn't make sense. I I just they aren't very strategic thinkers. They had long refused to do some of the things that would have. I mean, the, the, the smart money would have been on the under, stay in the union and play this out. As late as what, 1862, 1863, Lincoln was offering a gradual emancipation plan that spun out to 1900. That's a lot better than 1863. Now, obviously all of that couldn't have been foreseen, but a lot of what I've written about in the last you know, 15 years is really just to say, war and emancipation, that's a thing. And it's uh, it has it has a gendered history, you know. We can write about it because if you're if you're emancipated in war, that emancipation is not the same for women as for men, obviously. But why does it take so long for us to think about this? We talk about emancipation even with Reconstruction. We talk about Reconstruction. We don't don't talk about the Military Reconstruction Act. The minute that word military is there, there's a get the men um, heat seeking missile to that, right? So I don't know. I think it's the million dollar question and I have answers, but none that are very satisfying. I'd love to know yours. Thank you. Um, it looks like some folks agree with you in the chat as well. Um, so the next question is from our friend Clint who asked, uh, what are the one to three most pernicious myths in popular understanding of the war um, that your research and your book counter? Um, okay, um, number one, um, that, um, that's, that secession was driven by anything other than the attempt to make slavery perpetual. And I say that point blank in the um, introduction and the first radio show I ever did on this book, the radio host read that quote point blank directly to me and I was kind of shocked and I was forced to defend it. And then I realized I believed it. That was fine. I could defend that because I can take the heat. So I think that's number one. I think number two, that is, um, it is a myth that is, uh, I think still alive. So that 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 contains the whole serious mythology about this was um a, this was uh this was a, a war to defend states' rights um against the tyranny of a of a despotic federal government. That's what it was by the 1870s. That's what they were saying by the 1870s, but nobody was saying that in 1861. Um, 
Another myth, big one, that I just won't die, it's like driving a stake through the heart of uh, Dracula, is um, that the Confederacy was going to free its slaves because they valued them in independence more than they valued slavery. That's absolutely wrong, as I tried to explain in five minutes tonight. Um, and I guess another myth has to do with, um, uh, with just the gender of the whole thing. Like who's, who, who's, 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 like who lives in history? I don't know how else to put it. There's this sort of sense that in, in too much, too much, it, like it's, it's the 21st century and we still, we still tell whole histories of war that have no women in them. And because the military history and political history is so important in how people think about change and how history works, the, the absolute sort of um, blindness to women's own stakes in all of these struggles is uh, um, mysterious to me. So, um, you know, women actually do care about causes in war. Have a look at Ukraine. You know, in the 19th century, um, what's his uh, face? The, the Spanish pa painter Goya is painting pictures of women in Madrid resisting the invasion of the French army in the Napoleonic War. I mean, this is not a secret. So I think there's kind of this Antigone fiction that women are outside war, they're outside politics, all they care about is their husbands and their children. Well, even if, like, if you, men are in families too, but the fact that women are in families doesn't mean that they don't have a, a living connection to the world and stakes in the world that they're in. And, you know, in the case of the Confederacy, some of that means that slaveholding women become diehard Confederates. Like the last, like the, they're the ones who revived Jefferson Davis, who nobody had anything good to say about, believe me, by 1863 and 1864. So I think there's just a tremendous unwillingness to see women as, um, uh, as actors in war or only as victims of war, not as actors in it. That's why I wrote my book, Her War, to just sort of exercise those demons so I think that's all, that's not exactly a myth because it's just in everything. It's not a myth in the same way the other two are, but I think it's a myth about history, not just Confederate history, military history, political history, history. And I'm honestly really sick of it. That one really gets my goat. Thank you. The next question is um, from one of our rangers, Maddie, who I'm going to put on the spot for a second, Dr. Mercury, because um, Maddie actually had an ancestor who was involved in the Richmond bread riots. Um, so we'll have to introduce you to her. Um, but uh, Maddie asked, you touched on the oath of allegiance as a mean means for pro-Confederate civilians or soldiers to retrieve enslaved people behind U.S. lines. Can you go into more detail about how that shows Confederates willingness to abandon their cause, even if momentarily, to protect slavery? How did emancipatory policies impact this practice? Um, that's a terrific question, but can I first answer, Maddie, by saying that one of my proudest moments is that a number of years ago, probably more than 10 now, I taught a summer teachers program for Gilder Lehrman, an organization in New York, and one of the wasn't a teacher up, there was a park ranger in the um, in the group. And they all had to do a project. Most of the teachers did projects that they would use in their classroom, whatever their grade level was. But he created a walking tour of the Richmond bread riot. So I don't know if you guys know about this or know this guy. I haven't seen him in like, you know, 10 or 12 years. But I was so thrilled when I he wrote me and said that that's what his, well, I knew that was his project because he told me about it at the time. And then he wrote me and said, I've never been able to go on it because I'm always teaching in April, on April 2nd. But he, um, anyway, so that's very, that's one of my proudest moments is that there actually is real on the street uh, consequences of this kind of um, research. So this Oath of Allegiance thing is really fascinating. I actually didn't talk much about it tonight because I just wanted to, you know, keep it moving. But one of the, one of the two things about your question, Maddie, one is that there's a point in 1862 in occupied areas of the South, the Union comes in and they start making Confederate women take oaths of allegiance, which they did not to begin with because they didn't think it really mattered. Then they're occupying these cities. Winchester was a really great example, New Orleans. Winchester changed hands something like 70 times during the war. 
New Orleans, all these uh, uh, elite um, pro-Confederate women are causing enormous problems for the army of occupation. And they're going to expel them from the lines if they don't take the oath of allegiance. So that's one example of that. But, and I think that's really a recognition of women's political identity. Now they're now their loyalty and treason counts too. It didn't at the beginning. Nobody cared whether they were loyal or treasonous. It took five minutes for that to change. And then the question of oaths of allegiance and um, slaveholders, you know, the, the, the union is quite slow and uneven in moving towards emancipation. So some commanders will allow slaves to take enslaved people to take refuge in their camp. They're supposed to return them. Some do, some don't. But the ones who do, and you can read this in the National Archives records, the military records, they will literally allow slaveholders to come into their camp, search, and see um, enslaved people and take them out. But they would have to sign an oath of allegiance to recover those people. And, and slaveholders would talk about, the, and at the end of the war, it was true also. They had to sign oaths of allegiance to regain, say, land that was confiscated. Um, uh, and they would sign, and they would do it inside. Um, they had to do it, for example, to trade with the Union military. So they wanted to sell foodstuffs or whatever, or move cotton um, you know, through the Union lines. And they signed these oaths of allegiance, many people, and they would write in their personal papers about how, you know, um, they didn't believe it. It was paper, they would sign it because this was what was required of them to retain their property. I mean, you know, many of these people, there was a huge amount of property at stake of, of value. And also, as I said, and it wasn't a joke, like a lot of it is mortgage. And they're still on the hook for those debts. So there was a lot of, um, you know, one of the things that uh, somebody needs to write something more popular about the illegal cotton trade on the Mississippi River and probably on the coast too, because um, lots of traders are signing oaths of allegiance so that they can be authorized to trade cotton uh, because they're broke. And they can't get any, there's a huge amount of cotton backed up behind Union lines. Another really interesting thing is that the Confederate government would periodically order planters to burn cotton because they didn't want the Union army seizing it. So when they were withdrawing, they would order them to burn cotton. Well, that's a tough order. Some did, some didn't, many didn't. So there's a there's a, a there's a really, you know, I think very interesting history there about um. I mean, basically, I put it in a very direct way, which is um, like the, the, the newspaper that said they're more willing to sacrifice their sons than their slaves to the war. Well, you know, and it was their republic. It was doing their bidding. But they did not want the army to put their property at risk. They did not, they, and in many cases, put their property over um, the cause of the, of the army and the government. So... I think that's a fascinating sort of human part of the story too. And you know, like there's there's one of my students years ago wrote an, a dissertation on a book about Kentucky, which as you know was in the Union. And he his his, his book wasn't called this, but his dissertation was called "Belated Confederates," because after emancipation, those con those Kentucky slaveholders became um, really pro-Confederate. Um, because they cared more about the protection, they stayed in the union to protect their property. That was their that was their gamble, and in fact, they did pretty well out of that because they were the last state to um, be forced to um, to free their slaves, but not until the Thirteenth Amendment. Yes, Benjamin Thank Butler did try to do the Oath of Allegiance uh, to women in New Orleans. It's in fact, there's a I, I I almost had a slide on that and I took it out because of um, there's all these incredibly well dressed women walking into the provost's off, marshal's office in New Orleans and in crinolines and signing these uh, oaths of allegiance. And I have I have a few copies of the those little pieces of paper that they had to sign. Um, so that's I think a problem. Trying to, I think it was probably Harper's Weekly also, or one of the illustrated uh, newspapers. Mm 
Awesome. I think that that was the last question, um, at least that I'm seeing, Beth. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your questions. And Dr. Murphy, again, thank you for your wonderful and informative answers. My pleasure. It was nice to spend the evening with you all. Yeah, this was um, an absolutely tremendous talk. Thank you so much, Dr. McCurry. Um, delighted to have had you kicking off our 160th. Um, for everybody else who's still on the line here, we did post in the chat the link to the other events that will be going on this week and this coming weekend. We hope that you'll, if you're in the area, you'll be able to join us for those. Um, also, if you are interested in seeing this uh, talk again, because it was so great, uh, we will be captioning it and putting it up on the website in the months to come. Keep an eye on our social media uh, for the, the posting. Um, thanks again, Dr. McCurry. Thanks to everyone who came here. Um, have a great night. Bye.